Welcome to the International Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 9th, 2023. The title of this lesson and voice commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School Commentary, is The Disciples Come to Believe the Resurrection. First of all, let me start by saying happy Resurrection Sunday to you. I hope you're able to enjoy this with your family without losing the true meaning of what this Sunday represents. Hey, if you enjoy watching our lessons each week, please join us by subscribing, commenting, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Now, before we get into our lesson, let's start with the moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you giving you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we just thank you for your son, Jesus, dying on the cross for our sin and making a way for us to be able to commune with you, to be one with you, and be able to live forever with you. Lord, we love you, honor, and praise you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture is coming from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27, as well as verses 30 through 31, and we'll be in the New King James Version of the Bible today. Then our main thought will be coming from Luke chapter 24, verse 31, which says, then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Now, the aim of our lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will recall the struggles of Jesus' first followers to embrace his resurrections and mentor our own struggles to believe things that we can't explain and proclaim the good news of Jesus' resurrections faithfully. Now, as we do each week, we're going to start with a little bit of background. We're now in the sixth lesson of the third quarter in the unit titled Experiencing the Resurrection. This week's lesson is coming once again out of the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Gospel of Luke does not identify its author. However, from Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, as well as Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it's clear that the same author wrote both Acts and Luke in addressing them both to the most excellent Theophilus, possibly a Roman dignitary. Now, the tradition of the early days of the church has been that Luke, the physician, a close companion to the Apostle Paul, wrote both Luke and Acts, according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, as well as 2 Timothy chapter 4. This would make Luke the only Gentile to pen any books in Scripture. Now, unlike the other synoptic Gospels, Mark, as, uh, Matthew, and John, Luke writes the Gospel as a historian, rather than as a firsthand witness like, they, like them, he, uh, his extensive writing also include, again, the book of Acts, as he wrote that as well. These are deliberate, organized, carefully researched accounts of these events of the life of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Luke focus on the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke's Gentile perspective presents Jesus as the Savior of all people, offering both forgiveness and direction to those who follow him. Now, leading up to our lesson today, Jesus had walked the earth for 33 and a half years, performing miracles over the last three years, healing the sick. He, he's given sight to the blind as well as raised the dead. He also showed the world what true love is by being a servant leader, washing the disciples' feet and feeding the poor. But Jesus' main ministry was to reconcile mankind back to the Father. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And Jesus chose to die for our sins. He died on the cross for our sins, but that's not where the story ended. On the third day, the Bible tells us he rose, and then they came to pay respect to his body, but the tomb was empty. This was from our lesson last week. When the disciples made their way to find the tomb empty, they walked away, still in disbelief. However, the resurrected Christ was about to make his continued presence known to them. And this is where our lesson picks up in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 16, which says, And behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they walked together 
of all these things which had happened. So as it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Jesus, brothers and sisters, assured his disciples that though he must leave them, he would not leave them comfortless or powerless. He promised them that they would come, that he would come to them through the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit for fellowship, for guidance, comfort, strength, as well as strength. He also promised that by abiding in him, they would experience his life as they become fruitful disciples, men with a mission and a purpose in life, according to the Gospel of John, of course. Now, included in those promises of Jesus, he also gave specific revelation regarding his death and uh, resurrection, both of which was essential to his, these promises. Yet we find that after his death, um, the, the disciples here are found as sad and gloomy, um, fearful, complex, as well as scattered and defeated. They're running in retreat with no sense of mission or purpose that Jesus had given them. They were men in desperate need of a Savior's touch, and they needed his comfort and direction more so at that time than any other time. And guess what? This is also how we feel some at, at times when the world gets complicated and everything we see around us looks like doom and gloom. We find in these times that what we see and understand causes us not to lean on the promises of Jesus and lean more on our understanding due to the sorrow in our heart. But just as Jesus came and saw about the disciples here we are, that we'll be discussing today, he comes to see about us as well. See, as these two disciples were walking in shame and despair, Jesus heard them. Did anyone catch that? He heard them. He heard their cry. He saw their fear. He witnessed their pain, even when they thought they were walking alone, conversing with one another. So one might ask, why, why would Jesus appear now? Well, let's consider some of these reasons of why Jesus appeared at this point as his resurrected self. The first of all, the, the, the reason might have for him appearing at this time to these men after the resurrection was to show himself alive and give evidence that he accomplished victory as the resurrected and glorified Savior. Also, through these appearances, Jesus taught the disciples back then, as well as us right now, a great deal about himself and his relationship and ministry to all believers, doing his, uh, though he was uh, physically absent from the church. And lastly, Jesus' appearances also teaches us the truth about his availability, as well as his companionship, and how that works in, uh, in our favor, even though he's physically absent from us, yet he's always with us as our companion as we walk through this world. Jesus' appearances also teach, teach us about ourselves, our need and our tendencies. Here, he shows our need for his fellowship, for his understanding of the scripture, our need for the faithfulness. As we see his disciples here, their, their ability to handle the pressures of life, we need Jesus. And this is why Jesus appeared as a resurrected Christ to the disciples, uh, as we're talking about here today, as well as other occasions in the Bible. People need to understand that he lives even after death. So now when we look here at verse 16, it says that they were prevented from knowing who Jesus was at the time. See, the other two synoptic gospel actually shared light on this for us. If we look at Mark, Chapter 16, verse 12, it says, after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. In John chapter 20, verse 15, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. These verses suggest their inability to recognize Jesus was, first of all, a product of or, or phenomenon of his glorified body at the resurrection. 
See, he, he could appear as a gardener. He could appear just as a traveler um, withholding his actual identity here because this is not the Jesus they saw before with, with the flesh and bones like we had. This is the glorified Christ. So he could be anything that we needed him to be to show who he is. So the bigger question, question here is, why did God do this? Why, why did Jesus do this? Well, to illustrate how the Lord come to us in different ways and use different people and events to teach us as well as to reach us. For example, if we're feeling alone and mourning, the Lord can come to us as a comforter. If, if we, like Paul, need to be humbled, Christ can appear to us and knock the pride right off of us. Whatever we need God to do in order to reach us, God is there. He can take any form to reform the way that we think in order that we may see his glorified self, see him at work in our life. Now, as we move down to verses 17 through 24, it speaks of the conversation between Jesus and the foolish disciples at that time, which reads, and he said to them, what? kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of them, whose name is Cleophas, answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things had happened. Yes, a certain woman of our company who arrived to the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came that they had also seen a vision of the angel who said he is alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. See, here we find the disciples to begin to tell Jesus all the things that had happened to the prophet who was powerful and knew the word of God. But the mad priest killed him and now everything is over, basically, is what they were saying here. See, the disciples at this moment remind me of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, which says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. See, the disciples were disappointed, dismayed, and downcast, and their hopes were crushed at this time. They had great expectation that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel, and now their hopes had been nailed to the cross. If hope deferred make one heart sick, then certainly hope disappointed, especially such a grand hope as this would kill the heart when you think about it. Thinking that this their savior had died on that cross and remained there. Picture the hopelessness that they felt at this time. The question here though I have for you, have you ever felt disappointed when expecting your expectation goes awry, when all hope seemed to float away as a balloon in the sky? See, it's difficult to assimilate great disappointment and, and, and to pick up the, the, the fragments of our feelings and emotion, setting them back on track again when we feel such disappointment. It is even easy for us to begin to question the truth that we always held firmly and clear. This is where we find the disciples at this point. As a matter of fact, in a, a book called The Promise by Robert Morgan, he states that it's during these times that God wants to teach us his rich and deepest lesson. The Lord intends to stabilize, strengthen, and develop us. That's one of the reasons he allowed trouble to come our way. They are his tools of conforming us into the image of Christ. Well, in this time of despair, brothers and sisters, our focus needs to be off the mess that we are enduring and onto the master. Because when our eyes are fixed on the circumstances rather than Christ, our peace is robbed. Our joy is gone. Our hope and dreams, they just drift away. 
Yet through the Holy Spirit's power, we are given wisdom and strength, as well as endurance, not only to persevere through the trials per se, but to persevere through their trial with both peace and joy, because we have hope in the Lord. And we find in this conversation that they're having with our Savior, they're in disarray right now. They're in, they, their hope is gone. But Jesus continued to comfort them and, 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 and companionship with them at this time, even though they don't know he's right there with them, he's right there with them. That's what we need to know too, as well. Even though we may not feel that he's right here with us, he's companionship, his companionship with us, he's with us at all time. As the Bible say, he would never leave us, nor will he forsake us. Our lesson then picks up where Jesus speaks um, to them in verses 25 through 27, which reads, Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, art not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophet, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. See, these verses shows us a number of critical areas of need while also pointing out the divine remedy for our doubts, our fears, our grumbling, sadness, and absence of experiences of God's purpose and mission in our life. Th this is the remedy that Jesus is telling them. He says, um, foolish. Now, foolish is a Greek word which literally mean without understanding, but it generally carries a sense of blame. See, the use of this word suggests that the disciples' conditions were a product of their own indifference or self-reliance. When we rely on our own understanding, our own will, and our own thought, we're considered foolish because we're without understanding, where we need to lean on Christ's understanding. Remember, Christ had told the disciples several times that he must die, but will rise again. So the disciples here we find were sluggish towards God's words. There was no push, no desire to know the full knowledge of Christ. It revealed the attitude um, and, and the priority problem towards the scripture that they had there. Anytime we rely on ourselves instead of to what the scripture says, we're relying on ourselves. But here we find that the disciples were sluggish to know and believe the whole counsel of God's word. They were quick to believe in the promise concerning the kingdom and the removal of the Roman yoke, but they were so to, slow to believe the prophecy of a suffering savior that must die for our sins. They, they had a belief problem at their time at this time. And due to this belief problem, they had a loss of hope. There was a loss of joy as well due to this belief problem. So Jesus tells them that they should have believed what all the prophets had spoken here, that the, the, the Messiah would actually suffer first, then he will receive his glory. In order to redeem mankind, we understand that Jesus had to die. See, his death was for our sins, which led to his glory. Jesus reminded them that this is not new. He said it was written long ago. And guess what he used? He used scripture. That's the same thing we need to use to get over our doubts and fear. Jesus began to teach them the best taught Bible study known to man. He, he, he then graciously explained, it, explained all of the Old Testament, uh, that how the Old Testament was teaching about him, starting with, Genesis and, and the first five books of the Bible wrote by Moses, as he said, beginning with Moses. No doubt his, he was teaching of the many prophecies and promises that we hold dear right now. Jesus taught them all of the Old Testament prophecies that was written concerning him. Now, I'm sure as he was teaching them, he had to teach them about um, um, Isaiah more than likely, definitely, he told him about Isaiah 53, 5, which says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are healed. Certainly, Jesus told him about that. 
Now, because of the, the disciples were familiar with the scripture, they knew the scripture. It, this served them as a refresher. Jesus wasn't teaching them. He was reteaching them or re-showing them what they already knew to make sure they understand who he is. Listen, if we don't recognize Jesus, then Jesus is not free to work in our lives and in our heart. The dialogue here that he's having with the disciples uh, becomes the picture of the message of Jesus' death and resurrection and what it will be. See, just knowing the theological information without seeing and trusting in the spiritual implementations here leaves us weak and without power. We can't just believe in Christ in the scripture. See, even the enemy knows and believes to know that Christ is real. We have to have faith and trust in and obey Christ. That's what makes him the Lord of our lives. And that's when we can see him and recognize him and he can begin to work in our lives and sanctify us. Now, before we move to our final verses here, we find that verses 28 through 30, which is not a part of our lesson today, but these verses, um, the men asked Jesus to stay with them and, and eat. See, in these verses, we see the necessity of a positive response to the revelation of God's word. Jesus just gave them a word. He told them about the Bible, and then he was about to leave, and they said, no, could you, could you stay with us a little bit? He, he was a test for their hunger in response to God's word. Because in verse 28, it says he acted as though he would go further. It, it suggests that um, Jesus was, was going to move on here if they didn't urge him to stay, if they didn't get the point here. Please note that they would have remained unchanged at this point. Just these two men exchanging words here, they were still depleted. After hearing the word, they were still depressed and discouraged, but they did want to know more about the word. See, the Bible is truly living and acting and sharper than a double-edged sword with power to penetrate and change lives. But unless we respond and seek fellowship with the Savior through its pages, we will remain unchanged. So the disciples here asked Christ to stay along a little bit. Then in these verses that he took the bread and he broke it and be, uh, and began giving it to them. How interesting here. Listen, they had invited Christ to come and abide in their home. But as he did this, we find that Christ took over. See, when you invite someone in your home, normally you're the one that break the bread and you serve it. But here we find that Christ goes to their home and he assumed a position of host and not their guest. And as he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them, you see, Jesus is not just this un uh, unknown guest or unseen guest in their home. Jesus is always more than that. Jesus comes to be the, the one that take charge. Jesus is the one that leads our fellowship. So he's the he is the mighty minister and the lead, and he's the one who feed and sustain us. He leads and we follow. When we invite Jesus in, he comes in to take over. And that's what he did with the disciples here. He went to them and he took over. He broke the bread. He served the bread. And this is why they recognize him as we move to our final verses, verse 31 and 32, which says, then their eyes opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? See, they had a perception problem here. But now we find in verse 31, we, they see the power of the word gave light and spiritual insight to them. Suddenly, they were able to perceive that they were, uh, that this new companion, this fellow traveler was none other than the Lord Jesus himself, the one who died on the cross, the one who gave his life for our sin, the one who was resurrected early that morning. They begin to perceive and experience the reality of his presence. And as soon as they did that, it said he vanished here. It literally means he became invisible. 
This illustrates that God's relationship with believers as of today, we can't see him, but he's present. This is a spiritual fellowship with Christ in the word by faith. But through this physical uh, invisibility to us, he is never nevertheless there as the Holy Spirit opened our eyes to the truth of Christ and the real reality of his life and his ministry in our life. See, Jesus vanishing there shows us and showed them back then that we walk by faith and not by sight. The moment that they had faith in Christ, they no longer needed to see him. It was their faith was they're going to carry them from that point on. Right now, we have never seen Christ. It's our faith that carries us. And that's perfectly fine because we walk by faith and not by sight. These disciples journeying um, on, on this road needed the resurrected Christ to remove their blinders, which happens as he revealed himself um, and in the true meaning of the scriptures. And they said he, as he read the scripture and he went with them and he took charge and led them in, in communion, so to speak, they recognized who he was because he took the blinders off his eyes. When Jesus broke the bread with Cleophas here and the other disciples, their eyes opened and they recognized him. They marveled over how Jesus opened the scripture to them. Then on the next scene with a larger group of disciples, we'll find later on in Luke, Luke explained that Jesus himself opened their mind to understand the scripture. Here we see that Jesus brings clarity of the Bible is the central message here, and it gives his disciple the spiritual capacity to grasp his teaching. What does that mean? See, today, brothers and sisters, we can read the Bible until we're blue in the face. But understanding and applying what it says comes from the Holy Spirit within us. And just as Jesus removed the blinders from the disciples, it's the Holy Spirit that removed the blinders from us. And it's the Holy Spirit that is the only one that can help us recognize Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. The devil know the Bible backwards and forward, but he would never have salvation. So knowing the Bible is not enough. We have to believe what the word says. We have to trust in what the word said. And moreover, this is important. We have to obey what the word said. And this can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. Amen.